Got it. Thank you. Well, I usually put the burn surgeon on last because um, <clears throat> our gross pictures tend to keep people awake. So that's, that's my job today, I guess. So, Okay, um, so today I thought we would talk about a couple of things uh, that represent uh, inter interval increases in the care of, of burn patients. Uh, the data and the research that I'm going to present to you today has been funded uh, by these two organizations, and I do need to dis disclose that. So um, if we look through the history of burn care, we can, with very general statements, uh, say that each decade brings uh, uh, a new something that helps us take care of burn patients a little bit better. So in the 1950s, it was antibiotics. In the 1960s, it was resuscitation, the development of the Parkland formula and the Baxter formula by Dr. Dr. Baxter, shown here. In the 1970s, we started to control infection a little bit better with better ICU care and with the use of uh, topical antimicrobials. This really represented the time of widespread use of silvidine or sulfamylon cream or uh, silver nitrate. In the 1980s, uh, probably the biggest increase in um, modalities that resulted in better outcomes for burn patients was uh, the concept of early burn excision and, and skin grafting. And up until the early 80s, really the, maybe the late 70s, uh, burn care and burn patients were medical patients. They were not surgical patients. And from this point on, they became surgical patients. In the 1990s, we had our first real skin substitute. It was a dermal replacement, Integra. Most of you know about that. Our ICU care improved. In the 2000s, we saw just a proliferation of, of dressings. Uh, there are now hundreds, probably thousands of dressings. At uh, my burn center, we've tried to keep up with dressings over the years, and we can't do it anymore. There are just too many of them, of them out there. And so for this decade, uh, I think a lot of us were hoping, I certainly was hoping that this would be the decade of artificial skin. And I don't think we're going to make it uh, this decade, although one of the things I'm going to talk about today is getting us a little bit closer. However, this might be the decade that we talk about how we're starting to do a little bit better with the surgical management of burn patients. Not that we're not doing a, a bad job of that, but we just, we're not doing anything new or different over the last 20 or 30 years. The way we're taking care of patients in burn centers surgically is basically the same as we were doing it in the, in the 1980s. Yes? Okay. Um, there are three broad areas of, of burn research. Um, definition and modulation of the inflammatory response, as Dr. Moore alluded to. Burn patients just have this huge inflammatory and immune reaction to their injury, and that's one area of active research. Another area is prevention and treatment of hypertrophic scarring. Uh, at this point in time, survival is not a big issue for burn patients. Uh, but what do we do with these scarred and contracted, disfigured and dysfunctional uh, patients afterwards? And then finally, operative management of the burn wound, including development of, uh, of an artificial uh, skin. As, as I said before, uh, I think that this is an area of active research right now, and this may be the decade of, of really good improvement. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, is stratigraft. And this is stratigraft right here this little disc that's about 50 square centimeters. And it is a true bilaminate skin substitute, which means that there are two layers to it. There's an epidermal layer and there is a dermal layer. This was invented by a very smart lady at the University of Wisconsin. And the epidermis is made up of human keratinocytes. It's an immortalized cell culture line that is always available. And they call these NIKS cells. And when I was first introduced to this project, I wondered what acronym this was, what huge words would this be? And actually, it's just skin spelled backwards. Okay, and then the, the dermis on which the epithelial cells, the epidermal cells are grown is a mur murine or mouse-derived um, uh, dermis and it is made up of collagen and a few scattered cells, but not too many cells. Uh, the epidermal cells have been tested. They are non-tumorigenic. They are pathogen-free. Um, 
And uh, this can be produced in great quantities at fairly substantial expense, but can be produced in, in large quantities if, if need be. Looking at uh, stratigraphed underneath the microscope, it looks a lot like human skin. There's a keratinized layer of, of uh, cells. Um, on the outside, there are deeper cellular layers of the epidermis, and then there's a, there's a dermis underneath it. It looks very much like human skin. So what I really want to talk about is uh, the first study that we did with uh, stratigraphed. And it was a phase one uh, clinical trial where we put stratigraft uh, on patients after burn excision uh, at the same time as we were putting allograft on. Now, for patients with large percent total body surface area burns, the way we typically treat them is we take them in the operating room and we get the burn off as quickly as we possibly can. Getting the burn off is the most important thing. And then if it's a large percent uh, total body surface area burn, uh, then we cover them with a temporary skin cover, usually allograft, which is cadaver skin. So we did what, what we did with these patients is we just put a little bit of stratigraft on uh, where we normally would put allograft on. And then we followed them. This is sort of the flow chart. I'm, I'm not going to go through this. It's not particularly important. This is a list of patients that we did in this first uh, tiny study, and I'm not going to go through this either. But if we look at, uh, at these photographs, you can see that the stratigraph looks really good. Um, just like allograft, it adheres to the wound initially, and then it becomes vascularized. And occasionally, you can even see a little bit of epithelialization happening, happening in the little holes in the, in the graft. But eventually, stratigraft, just like allograft, uh, gets rejected and, and falls off. But at seven days, it looked really, really good. And um, my recommendation was that our next study was that we just simply leave the stratigraft in place and, and see what happens to it. Again, some more photographs of, of stratigraft. And uh, so at the end of seven days, the patients underwent um, autografting, which is normal. And we followed the autograft to see what happened. And it healed uh, normally in stratigraph patients, just like it did in allograft patients. And we looked at a bunch of other things, uh, quantitative cultures, keratinocyte viability, uh, thrombosis, and a bunch of labels for the cells. And there's no difference. Uh, in, uh, in the two groups of, of patients. So the conclusion that we got, we had from this particular study, is that uh, stratigraft was a pretty good replacement for allograft. And then the next question was, uh, what would happen to it if we just left it in place? So we did a very tiny pilot study uh, where patients who were undergoing autografting, um, grafting with their own skin, had a very small part of that uh, burn, that um, autograft site, grafted with a stratigraft. And it turns out that it, it healed pretty well. It did not heal as quickly as autograft, as you might anticipate, but none of those patients went on to require additional autografting where the stratigraft was. So based on that small pilot study, and I, those results have not been published, so I'm not going to show them to you right now, we proceeded with a phase three clinical trial, and that's where we are right now. We're doing a randomized uh, trial now comparing uh, stratigraft to uh, a normal autograft, and uh, we're maybe about a third of the way through that trial right now. So overall, I think that uh, stratigraft um, is a potential true skin replacement. It doesn't look like it's going to be perfect, but it is certainly the closest thing that we have uh, right now. And there are a couple of other possibilities with stratigraph. The thing that's really interesting about these keratinocytes is that they can be genetically engineered. They can be genetically engineered to make antimicrobial substances. Theoretically, they could make antibiotics. They could make uh, growth factors. So this is very interesting. The other thing that I think is great about this technology is that we could possibly use patients' own epidermal cells and seed the dermis with their own epidermal cells. And theoretically, that should make this much less immunogenic and much more likely to take. So there's a lot of really great work that can be done with this really outstanding technology. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is, is Recell, which is also known as the skin spray. <clears throat> it is not currently approved for use in the... Uh, in the US, and the data that I will talk about here has been gathered in a couple of clinical studies and under uh, a study for compassionate use of, uh, of Recell in the United States, and I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. So 
There are a couple of problems with um, surgical management of the burn wound. Uh, first of all, donor sites are problematic. Uh, donor sites meaning where we take skin grafts to graft patients. Uh, donor sites are painful, and the bigger they are, the more pain they induce. You have to wait to reharvest them. That is the, probably the biggest problem that we face with the surgical management of, of burn patients is that these patients come in and we get their burn off and then we have to get their own skin on and oftentimes we have limited donor sites and we take all the skin that we possibly can and we're able to graft a portion of their wound but only a portion of it and then we have to wait for those donor sites to heal to reharvest it. In the meantime, the patient is in the ICU and suffering all the complications that we, we just heard about. So um, the, the donor site is particularly problematic in that regard. The other thing is the donor sites themselves can cause morbid morbidity. They, they can get infected, they can form hypertrophic scars, they can form contractures. Along the same lines, for large percent total body surface area burns, when we don't have a lot of skin, oftentimes we mesh the skin to make it go further. And that sounds like a great idea, but there's a price that we pay for that. Mesh skin is not ideal also. The checkerboard pattern that you get with the mesh skin is permanent. And sometimes it can form really terrible hypertrophic scars. Um, Contractures and subsequent dysfunction are greater with uh, mesh skin. The bigger the mesh, the better, bigger the dysfunction. And hypertrophic scarring is much more common with meshed grafts than it is with non-meshed grafts. Okay, so when I talk about the skin spray, this is not the skin spray. Okay, this, um, there was a YouTube video um, that really demonstrated to me the power of social media, which I had not really experienced before, because this generated hundreds of phone calls uh, to the burn center about the magical purple skin spray in the, in the really cool looking gun. And uh, this is not what we're talking about here. This is what we're talking about. So in general, if I have a burn that's this big, I need a skin graft that's about this big. Using resell, if I have a burn that's big, this big, I can use a skin graft that's about this big. And this is the way it works. First thing we do is we harvest a very thin, small skin graft. It's about seven one thousandths of an inch, so it's, it's mostly epidermis with just a little bit of dermis uh, in there. Then it is incubated in trypsin, warm trypsin, for about 20 minutes. And this chemically separates the epidermis from the dermis. And it also chemically separates the epidermal cells from each other. After that, we physically separate it with a scalpel and uh, forceps, and then filter it, and we end up with a, a solution of individual epidermal cells. And that gets resuspended in a syringe, a little cap gets put on it, and that's where the resell skin spray comes from. This is an actual picture in our operating room. And as you can see, it's a typical burn case, uh, blood on the walls. And the, the resell device is the little, is there a laser in here? No. The resell device is um, the little white container there. On the far left-hand side on the top is a little black reservoir where the tri trypsin resides. And then um, the, you can see an area to filter it, and then the syringes on the right-hand side of the table those are used to aspirate the solution up and put a cap on it. It's very, very simple technology. It's pretty quick and easy, and um, it is not technically challenging in any way. Um, for the most part, the, the cell suspension is keratinocytes, but there are also melanocytes, which are important because uh, they provide repigmentation. That's particularly important in people with lots of pigment in their skin. And there are some fibroblasts, although this has to be considered an epidermal spray. It is in no way a spray that repopulates or regenerates dermis. It's only epidermis. So this is kind of the timeline, and I'm going to jump around a little bit. Uh, we initially started a, an FDA trial in 2010, and it was a comparative trial um, with the patient acting as his or her own control, and I'll describe that in just a second. And it was basically comparing resell versus two-to-one mesh. And then based on the results of that trial, uh, my center recommended that uh, we start using it for big burns and not just small superficial burns. And that led to the compassionate use of, of resell, and I, I will tell you that story in just a second. And then that resulted in a protocol change and uh, many more people used under the uh, compassionate use protocol. And I'm gonna show you the results of seven of those patients here in, in just a second. So this was the original trial. Uh, small uh, partial thickness or second-degree burn, 
uh, was divided in half. And half of the burn was treated with recell and half of the burn was treated with two to one meshed autograft and then we compared it to, you know, color and function and hypertrophic scarring and thickness and all that sort of thing. And what we found in my center is that um, sometimes the um, meshed site looked better and sometimes the recell skin spray site looked better, but the spot that always looked the best was the spot right in the center where there was mesh graft and some accidental overspray with the epidermal spray. So we went back to the principal investigator and we said, we shouldn't be doing small burns with this, we should be doing large burns with this. We should be using widely meshed autograft on big burns and spraying the whole darn thing with, um, with, um, with the spray. And that's where the compassionate use came from. Anyway, so this is a, a typical example of, of a patient in the initial recell trial. And as you can see, proximally on the leg, there's two to one meshed autograft. And distally on the leg, there's skin spray. And then right in between is the area that we think looks best. It doesn't project very well, I suspect, here. All right, so um, after we use the initial compassionate use of recell, uh, the protocol was changed and we started to enroll patients into a compassionate use protocol. And I want to talk about those seven patients and I'll move through them uh, fairly quickly here. So uh, average age was 27, male to female ratio was a little bit low for us. Uh, race was pretty normal for us. And the bow or the bow scale, which is the sum of the patient's age and percent total body surface area, which is a very, very gross estimation of the mortality, was very high. It was in the 90s, and we had a couple of people where it was greater than 100. Uh, the etiology of all these patients was uh, flame. Uh, the median duration of injury, I mean, from the time that the patient hit our unit until the time that we had theoretically covered them was 21 days, three weeks, which is pretty aggressive uh, therapy. And if you look on the graph on the left bottom corner, uh, you can see the percent total body surface area of these seven patients. So 80, 90, 60, 55, 40, 50, 60. So pretty big burns. And on the uh, right-hand side, you can see the distribution of these burns. Now, this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but the, the, the patients are along the bottom, and square centimeters are along the y-axis. And the dark blue is the, um, the burn area that was treated with graft and recell. The gray area is, gray bar, is uh, the donor site, and the light blue is the total of, of these two things here. So you can see we used a lot of recell on these patients. And not only did we spray the recell over the skin grafts, we, play, we spray the uh, recell over the donor sites also. Uh, this is a, a great slide, and I, I'm gonna have you just look at the right-hand side uh, for right now. Um, what this shows is percent of total wound closure. Now, this is not just the grafted areas. This is total wound closure. And by four weeks in all of these patients, we had greater than 90% uh, wound closure. So for 80, 90% total body surface area burns with greater than 90% re-epithelialization within four weeks, that's, uh, that's a pretty good outcome. And when we looked at donor site healings, about half of them were healed at... Uh, at um, at uh, one week and over 90% at two weeks. And this is, again, really important uh, because the sooner the donor sites heal, the quicker you can reharvest them. And we generally are able to harvest, reharvest donor sites between seven and 10 days. Uh, the resell knocked off a day or two uh, in most of our patients uh, here. And then I'm just gonna run very quickly through the compassionate use of resell. Uh, we had a young couple who came home uh, from being out and they lit a candle in their house and unbeknownst to them, their house was filled with natural gas and the house literally exploded. It was completely destroyed. And the gal was 21 years old, had a 53% total body surface area burn. Uh, the male was 32 with a 60% total body surface area burn. So this is the gal and as you can see, she's got deep partial thickness or full thickness burn. She required an escherotomy on the medial side of, uh, of both of her legs and you can't see it but on the dorsum of her feet also. Um, and this is after um, several grafting procedures, one to one leg, one to the other leg, uh, with the resell procedure. This is about uh, two weeks after grafting. So you can see she's got good coverage. Uh, she's very inflammatory, obviously, but uh, good epithelial coverage here. And this is a couple of months out. And as you can see, she's got some pigment problems, but overall the, the graft here looks pretty good on, on her. This is the, oh, these are her donor sites. 
Uh, she was just starting to get an extensive tattoo. That tattoo ended up in various other places on her body, um, which she thought was pretty cool. Uh, and these are her donor sites. And we harvested these areas uh, twice. And you can see that that's a pretty good outcome for donor sites. This is the young man, uh, deep partial thickness burns of his back. And this is after two to one grafting with resell. This is two to one skin grafting of deep partial thickness burns of the back. That's a pretty good outcome. Look at this, all right? This is what mesh grafts, two to one mesh grafts are supposed to look like. It looks a little bit different than what he looks like. And these are his donor sites here. So this is them here um, afterwards. So Resell improved the surgical management of burn wounds in large percent total body surface area uh, patients. It d demonstrated excellent healing with good cosmetic and functional outcomes. Uh, also very important is the treatment of donor sites uh, resulted in more rapid healing of the donor site and the ability to reharvest them. So resell should be considered for use in patients with large percent total body surface area burn. And I have to tell you that in, in my shop where I work right now, this is a game changer. Uh, we will be using this, once it's approved, we will be using this on almost every case. Any time we put a donor site on, on a patient, we will be using this procedure for the donor site alone. But if we have to put mesh graft on somebody, we'll be using this over the top of it. So uh, management of the burn wound is still dependent on early excision and grafting. We do not have the golden chalice of a, of a uh, true um, skin substitute or artificial skin, but Stratigraph definitely shows promise in this regard. Resell use with mesh grafts and on donor sites left, led to really acceptable wound outcomes and a contraction of the time that the patient has to spend in the ICU and in the hospital. So both Stratigraft and Resell will likely be useful in the improved management of the burn wound. This is my partner, Dan Caruso, who passed away in August. Uh, we were partners for 19 years at the Arizona Burn Center. And he was uh, one of the people who initially started uh, ASTRAC uh, nine or 10 years ago. And I just wanted to say a word about him. And with that, I will stop. Thank you.